Deer sunrise and sunset photos tend to come out a little disappointing. Maybe they're underexposed and dark, just not what you saw with your eye while you were out there. Well, today what I'm gonna do is show you four tips to guarantee that you come home with stunning photos that you can edit and put together to have beautiful sunrise and sunset images. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Reeder, and today I'm gonna to show you how I approach taking photographs at sunrise and sunset. Taking photos during the evening or in the morning, it's one of the most popular times for photographers to get out there and shoot photos. The problem is, is it's hard sometimes to get the image that you really want based on the low light and the tough conditions that you might be facing, especially if you haven't done it much. When I first got my camera, one of the first things I went out to do was take a picture at sunset. So I found a local field, I went up on a hill. Uh, there were pretty decent conditions, but the image that I ended up with was really pretty boring. Um, in fact, if you go back to my early Instagram feed, it's one of the first shots that I posted. Uh, let's take a look at it real quick. So as you can see, this shot is pretty boring. There's not a lot going on here. You've got some color in the sky, um, and then you've got just kind of a tree line, and it's really dark, and uh, it's just kind of a boring photo. Um, so if you compare that to a more recent one that I took, now this shot has a lot going on. Uh, it's visually much more exciting. You've got some images, some imagery in the foreground that looks really good. The colors are sharp um, and vibrant. You've got some nice reflections on the water, some cool clouds in the sky. So it's really uh, a big difference between my original, one of my early sunset shots compared to what I'm able to put together now. And a lot of this is just based on experience that I've had as I've shot these over time. So I can attribute this improvement to four different things that I've done over time to really improve my photography. So let's jump right into it. Um, stick around till the end. I've got a couple of hacks, two different editing hacks actually, that will really help elevate your photos when you get into the editing room. So stick around to the end to get to those. But first off, step number one. The first step to getting good photos at sunrise or sunset is planning. Uh, so conditions have a big impact on how your photos are gonna come out. Uh, what I tend to do is look at sky cover. Um, there's a couple of different resources that I've used. Uh, Weather.gov is a website where you can put in a zip code and it shows you uh, a graph of the conditions over time, hour by hour. So I really like to look at the sky cover, um, obviously like temperature, humidity, some of those factor in, but really sky cover is one of the main things that I look at. Another resource I use is PhotoPills. Um, that's an app that lets you plot uh, a certain point on a map and you can see the angle of the sun when it's rising and when it's setting. So you can kind of determine what location might work best for you if you want to capture either sunrise or sunset. Once you're there, make sure that you stick around until after the kind of main point. So the sun rises or the sun has set, stick around a little, little ways afterwards, 30, 45 minutes even sometimes, um, you can get some really good shots. Um, so I'm gonna show you a, a few different photos that I took of Nubble Lighthouse. And these were taken over the course of an evening. And you can actually see that these have um, different coloring depending on what time of day it was. So the first one, this was shot um, a little earlier, just as the sun was setting, you can see there's that golden glow coming down over the lighthouse um, with the kind of blue in the background. The sky is still blue, just starting to change colors. Um, this next shot is just maybe 15 minutes later, once the sun had set and you get that kind of alpen glow, pink coloring in the background, and that really completely changed this shot. And it was really only maybe 15 minutes after that first one. And then I stuck around until really deeper into blue hour and I got this last shot here, which the sky has gotten dark, it's gotten blue, but now you've got this really nice glow on the water, the lighthouse is lit up. So, you know, sitting in one location for the course of maybe an hour, both before and then after the sun has set, gives you all these different conditions. So it's really worth not just shooting for one specific moment, but kind of sticking there for as long as you need to, to get, to get really some different options to work with later on. Step number two in this process is really to do with settings and setup. So it's using the settings on your camera to make sure you're capturing the right conditions. Obviously the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is use a tripod. Um, so having a firm tripod to give you that, um, that base so that way you can use slower shutter speeds without getting that shake that will blur your camera is really important. Um, that's first and foremost. The second part is really thinking about that balance between shutter speed and your aperture. So something to consider is when the sun is up in the sky, uh, bef either before it's set or um, after it's risen, um, you're going to have probably a slower, or, or I'm sorry, a faster shutter speed because you, it's going to be a brighter situation. You don't want to have um, too much light coming in. It's going to overexpose things. So that's the first thing to consider. 
Once the sun is out of sight, you can be a little more flexible with your shutter speed. So you can slow it down, maybe get those long exposure shots you might be looking for, and you can kind of compensate with your f-stop. I usually try to get somewhere in the range of um, f-stop of like 9, 10, 11, somewhere in that range tends to work best. Uh, that really gives you kind of a good depth of field that you're working with, um, but it also doesn't open it up too much where it's too bright or close it down where it's too dark. So it kind of gives you some nice flexibility, but really it's, it's all about messing, messing around with things and trying different combinations that are going to work depending on the scenario. I would definitely recommend trying different combinations each time to see which ones end up working for you. Let's jump into a couple of shots that I've taken to see some of those settings and what the results end up looking looking like. Okay, this shot is a sunset shot that I took over in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And as you can see, I'm at f11. And I'm at 1 250th of a, of a second for my shutter speed. So because the sun was still in the sky, if I shot too slow of a shutter speed, if I had it open um, longer, it would have really overexposed this and it made it really difficult to get a good shot. Um, so I had to have a faster shutter speed and I really helped to kind of bring out some light after the fact in, in Lightroom. Now compare that to this shot that I shot in the morning. It's a sunrise um, photo in Rye, New Hampshire. And in this one you can see um, I was at F10. And in this situation, because the sun had not yet come up, I was able to do a longer exposure. So this is a 3.2 second exposure. Um, and that gave me a chance to pick up the details in the rocks here. And you can get these colors in the sky and the reflection. And you get a little bit of that kind of silky texture in the water because it was a longer exposure. And so because the sun wasn't up yet, I was able to have a longer exposure to capture those items. Now, when it comes to ISO, um, really you wanna keep that as low as possible as always. So a lot of these shots I've got around ISO 50, that's the lowest my camera goes. Um, but if you have to increase it, um, again, just experiment with it and see what you can do uh, to kind of get the best situation. So I wouldn't really use an auto ISO. I, I always uh, keep it as low as I possibly can and I'll usually adjust the shutter speed or the aperture if I need to, just to keep that ISO low. Otherwise, as you get up, creep up higher, you're gonna get some noise in your shot. Um, which you can clean up afterwards, but it always looks better to not have that on the front end. When it comes to focus, I always try to use manual focus as much as possible. In lower light, autofocus really struggles, at least on my camera it does. So um, I use um, focus peaking to make sure that I can see which part of the image is actually in focus. It'll show you in your viewfinder if you haven't used that before, um, go through your menu to figure out where that is. Um, but that really helps for me to see, especially in lower light situations, which part of the image is actually in focus. And that way I can, I can basically have as sharp a photo as possible. I would also recommend shooting in RAW uh, versus shooting in a JPEG format. The file size is much larger, but what that lets you do is it just brings in a lot more information. And so that way when you're, when you're processing it after the fact, you'll have a lot more flexibility with bringing back out some of those details that might be lost otherwise. So while it is a much larger file size, um, you know, storage is so cheap these days, it's, you know, you get a five terabyte external hard drive and it's not even a hundred bucks. So you can store a lot of images on that. So I would always recommend shooting a RAW whenever possible. The third step is to try and create an interesting composition. Um, so that can be easier said than done. You know, you think about my first image that I showed and it was just the sky and some trees. There really wasn't much going on, not much context, not much scale. Now compare that to the, the shot I just showed you of the beach and rye. And again, you've got these different rocks in the foreground so you can kind of see some texture and some context here. So yeah, the sky is pretty, there's some nice color here, but it's the rocks that really make this image much more interesting than it would have been if it was just, you know, zoomed into just the sky with the water without much else going on. What I try to do as often as possible is come up with something creative um, to make the image a little more dynamic. So some examples are, getting a reflection in the water. A lot of my shots have water in them. So getting some reflection of the sun over the water is always nice. Even in a puddle, um, I've gotten some really cool shots of sunrises and sunsets in puddles, um, reflecting on the street. Um, here's a shot that I took of an actual house that has a reflection in the window. So this is in Strawberry Bank in Portsmouth. And I couldn't get a really good shot of the sunset, uh, sorry, the sunrise because there just wasn't a lot as far as like trees or things to shoot. So what I found was this house with this cool reflection in the window. And this turned into a kind of a creative shot where I've got the sunrise here and just the kind of warm glow on the side of this house really turned out to be something a little more creative, a little different. 
Some other creative ideas you might find are shooting a sunburst around an object. So once the sun is up or before it's set, if you have a tree or some other object and you can get that sunburst around it, that's a really cool shot. Um, using the moon uh, at moonrise or moonset, if you can line up the timing of the sun setting while the moon's coming up, those are really cool shots that you can get. Another option is just those kind of longer exposure shots around water. So especially at the ocean, if you can get those crashing waves coming through, that looks really cool in those low light situations. So before I get to my final step in this process, um, if you found value in this video, if you liked it so far, please give it a like. Um, consider subscribing to the channel. I'm really excited to get this going and I'll be posting new videos every week. So it really helps me out to get that feedback and to get those likes. All right, step number four is editing. So once you get back and your shots are all taken and you're looking at those in your computer, um, I use Lightroom to edit my photos, but there's a lot of different editing softwares out there. Um, that's really where I think the magic happens. So you can take shots that maybe on the scene, you might've looked at them on your camera and they didn't look great, and then really turn them into something spectacular once you're, once you're using the editing software. So I'm super excited to show you a couple of things that I do when I'm editing sunrise and sunset photos. Something to keep in mind is that when it comes to color in the sky, just a little bit of color in there actually can go a long way. So you, um, you can't really fake composition, but you can work with colors even if they're really subtle in your original shot. So I talked about shooting in RAW. There's a lot of information in those files. And so you can, there's a lot of flexibility and power that you have in Lightroom to bring those colors out in the sky. So it actually looks like what it would look like when you were there versus what that image might come off your camera as. So there's two different editing hacks that I wanna to share today. One has to do with color and one has to do with masking. So let's jump in and I'll show you. All right, for this shot, um, this is just kind of a simple sunrise shot, Old Orchard Beach in Maine. And I just wanna show you how you can use intersecting luminance masks to really capture a good sky. So what I'm gonna do is just go into the basic part here. I've already just brought the exposure up just a little bit um, just to brighten this up because it was a pretty dark image to start. And what I wanna do is just bring out some of the details in the sky here without messing with this structure over here. So what I could do is just use a linear gradient and I drop that in there and kind of gradually impact. I don't wanna overdo where the sun is. So the linear gradient works well. Um, compared to just selecting the sky. But the problem is, is now I'm intersecting with this house um, or this structure over here. So what I can do is if I now use this option to intersect the mask with a luminance range, what I can do is go over and choose the sky. And now you can see this kind of yellowish highlight that I have showing what's selected is not overlapping with the house over here. And what I'm probably gonna do is try and get a little bit more of the sky. So I'm gonna get a little bit brighter here. And what I wanna try to do is get as much of the sky as possible without getting the coloring on the house here. So I can probably, if I see if I drag this down, it's starting to get more of the, the structure there. So I wanna find kind of a mid range there where it's kind of minimally impacting the, the structure and getting as much of the sky as possible. So that looks pretty good right there. So now using those two different masks, I've just got the top of the sky here. And now what I can do is I can go down and maybe drop the highlights a little bit, maybe add a little bit of dehaze to get some texture in there. Um, maybe add a little bit more saturation just to bring out the colors in the sky there without overdoing the actual really colorful part of the sun here. Um, so yeah, you just get a couple of different features here and you can kind of see the before and after. I'm just doing subtle changes here. I'm not overdoing it, but you can see that it's not impacting the house, which is, which is the desired um, state here when it comes to intersecting those two masks. Now the second hack is when it comes to color. So you can just use that global saturation slider to add some color to it, but I find that that's a little too strong in a lot of situations. So what I try to do is use the color calibration tool, specifically the blue hue for that. So if I jump over here back to that same image and I'll show you what it looks like if I'm gonna be done with that mask I just added. So now if I wanna go into these global settings, if I were to start to bring up the, the overall saturation, it really gets, over the top pretty quickly. So I don't wanna overdo those oranges and yellows there, but I do wanna bring out a little bit more color in the sky to get some of that blue. So rather than doing the global saturation or rather than messing around with each individual color, if you just go down to this, this calibration tool, which is kind of hidden at the bottom, if you do the blue primary and play with this saturation, it's a lot more subtle. So you can actually bring it up even pretty high and it's not that bad. That's probably a bit much, but 
compare, you know, adding it up to plus 70, it really adds a lot of color to this. You, know, you can kind of see the before and after. This is, this is after, this is going back to before. So it really brings out, it's, it's amazing how this blue primary actually impacts a lot of colors. Um, but it's just a little more subtle, but still powerful, um, you know, compared to what you might get with the overall saturation. So what I tend to do is stay away from global changes to vibrance and saturation. And I try to handle those either in the calibration down here or even getting into color grading in HSL. But I'll touch more on that in a, in a different video. So there you have it. Those are the four steps to getting better shots at sunrise and sunset. We went through getting the preparation done, uh, adjusting your settings, having a creative composition, and then also some of these editing hacks that you can use once you brought those photos back. So I hope this was useful and you learned something from it. Um, stick around for other videos in the future. I'll be posting those on a weekly basis. Again, if you liked it, um, give it a like down below. Uh, consider subscribing, and I will see you in the next video.